and welcome to Vive Nutrition Radio, the first ever Spanglish podcast where you will hear interviews with the top minds in nutrition, performance, fitness, and health in both English and Spanish. Here is your host, expert registered dietitian, Andres Ayesta, on a mission to help you take your nutrition to the next level. Hope you're ready for this. Let's dive right in. What's up, boys and girls? Welcome back to another episode of Vive Nutrition Radio. This is your host, Andres Ayesta. And today's episode is brought to you by um, nobody, because I don't have any sponsors in this podcast yet. Hopefully, we'll get to that point. I just wanted to say that because it sounded cool, and I hear an all kinds of really cool podcasts all the time. But I'm not that cool yet. But anyways, I wanted to say hi to you. I'm happy to see or hear your smiling faces or feel them, I guess, um, here today. So I want to, um, let's get to it. Let's get right to it, my friend. So um, today's podcast, I am bringing a great friend of mine. She is a colleague um, out of New York City. Um, I believe she lives in, I don't know, I forgot if it's she lives in Long Island, but she's from the New York area. And her name is Alex Turoff, and she is part of the same mentorship group that I am with, along with like obviously with Tony Stefan. I think I talked about him in the past, but Alex practices nutrition in a very similar way that I do. She believes in the concept of macro tracking to develop awareness around nutrition, and today's conversation evolved right around that. Alex Turoff is um, she has a bachelor's in clinical nutrition and media culture and communications from New York University. She has a master's degree in clinical nutrition from New York uh, University as well. She's also a certified personal trainer. She was a cycling instructor for a while as well. I believe she was at Equinox. I believe. I'm not really sure. I forgot. I think she mentioned it on the podcast that you'll get to listen here today. But anyways, um, Alex is here to share her story, what got her interested into um nutrition and how she, be, she she came to be and become a registered dietitian, her battle with eating disorders and, and body image and how she actually overcame that. Um, she's being admitted from my, sorry, I, she has been, sorry, I can't speak here today, but she has been a my fitness file user since 2005. I think this is back in the day when my fitness pal like I think probably launched before he was even bought by Under Armour. So we talked a lot about my fitness pal when it sometimes uh, becomes obsessive to use it. And we went in deep into understanding how for data driven people like her and I, it becomes a really helpful tool. She teaches through science based nutrition education and mindful eating the key to having it all um and she always kind of like claims on her instagram which by the way you need to check it out that it is possible to eat delicious foods drink cocktails exercise and all of it just because you can and it's not that difficult and you can have all the foods you want if you know how to include them so in today's conversation with alex turoff we went into all this and more. So hopefully you will get to enjoy this amazing conversation with her. But before you do so, I wanted to ask you a question. Have you downloaded my intermittent fasting um, email course yet? Because we're coming close to the time where we're just going to close those up and we're going to eventually open up a, a different uh, kind of course for you guys in the future. But if you haven't had a chance yet, make sure you go and snack one out. And it, you're going to find it at www.vv-nutrition.com. And this is a good place for you to be able to access it. And um, yeah, go ahead and download it. It's going to be also located in the show notes if you want to get it directly from there. So enjoy this conversation with Alex Turoff, guys. And I'll see you next week. All right, guys. So welcome back to Viva Nutrition Radio. Uh, today, I have the pleasure to have, as I mentioned in the intro, my friend and colleague, 
Alex Turoff. Hopefully I said that name right. Uh, Alex is a registered dietitian, as I mentioned, in New York City. And she and I are on the same mentorship group together and we get a, a chance to to chat. We've had a chance to chat a lot. And one of the cool things about Alex is that she practices very similar than I do. Uh, she's, like I said, a registered dietitian also. And you probably remember her because we did a nutrition roundtable with eight other dietitians and nutrition coaches. And she was one of the, uh, one of the dietitians that was present on that time. So I'm excited to bring her alone and the podcast. So Alex, my friend, welcome to View Nutrition Radio. How are you? This, uh, Thank this you. Thanks so much for having me. I am doing well. I'm so excited to be here and chatting with you. Me too. Me too. Um, I feel like we can kind of like, and, and I was like, as we were talking before we started the podcast, I feel like you and I like, we can kind of like just go in so many different tangents in here. So we're going to make this super conversational, but I always like to start um, with stories and I love to, to hear more about your background. Many different dietitians have different backgrounds and I'm super curious all the time to ask him what got them to, to what they're at today. Like what sparked that interest on becoming a dietitian? And um, I know your husband is a physician. So what kind of like got you started in, in this entire journey since you were little? Yeah. So I was chubby growing up. I, I don't want to say overweight or obese because looking back on it, I wasn't, but I felt so unhappy in my body. And I finally was fed up with it. And I decided to do something about it. And this was probably in ninth grade. So I was also going through that time, especially for women that it, you're just awkward. So that on top of looking at my friends and thinking they were thinner than me, but they were able to eat everything. And I just wasn't, I decided I needed to lose weight. But of course, I didn't really know what I was doing. So I just started eating less and less and less. And I saw that the scale was going down. I was getting compliments. It was awesome. And then the weight loss would plateau a little bit and you'd have to cut even more calories. And at that point, I was using my fitness pal to track my food. I went from a paper food journal and I have some of them. It's crazy to look at them where I was writing down what I ate and in parentheses, I would write the calories. And then my fitness pal, um, I don't even know when it came out, but this was like 2005 or mm -hmm. something. And I started using that and it was, you know, there, I was probably eating as little as 700 calories a day at one point. And I got wow. to where I wanted to be. And then, you know, you're never, you can never lose enough weight when you're in that mind, when you're in that mode of just going and going and going. And so I lost a lot of weight and then I needed to put on a little bit of weight because I was definitely very underweight. So this is when I kind of freaked out. I was so scared of gaining the weight back. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to take this very small amount of calories that I was eating and increase it in a way that wouldn't lead me to gain weight again. And I was also scared of food because I, I thought that if I started eating like a normal person, then I would be fat. So at that time, I worked with the dietitian who was not good. <laughs> um, wow. And was this back in like high school? Yeah, still. This was in high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, my parents were like, "You're way too thin. You need you need to go. You need to learn how to eat." So brought me to a dietitian, and she must not have heard anything I said because she she handed me a meal plan, and it was. 3000 calories. And like I said, I was probably eating 700 calories. There was no way I was going to all of a sudden eat 3000 calories. So I got nothing out of that. But at the time I found Lane Norton on the internet somehow. And he had all of this stuff about reverse dieting. And I'm like, Oh, that looks like what I need. I can, I need to learn to incorporate more food and start increasing my calories mm -hmm. and mitigating the weight gain. So I started reverse dieting slowly. I would add like 25 calories a day for the week. So I went from 700 calories to 725 and then I would hold there. And then I would add another 25 until I got, I think like I was maintaining my weight at like 2,600 calories um, at that really? time. So it was so 
it was such a valuable lesson for me. And it, even though I was still tracking my food and I was still thinking a lot about food, going from like that place of obsession and just terrible body image, even, you know, being at such a low weight and you just feel miserable all the time to seeing that food doesn't mean that you're going to be fat. So I needed to go through that process in order to develop a healthier relationship with food. So I hear often people will say in eating, uh, intuitive eating is such a great approach and it's, you know, you could just jump right into it. But for me, I would never have been able to do that at that point. I needed to, I needed something that felt safer to me. I needed to see the numbers and the data to, in order to get to the place that I could eat intuitively. And now I will say I eat for myself pretty intuitively because I eat the same types of things. I just know what works for my body. And then I revisit tracking when I need to. Um, but you just become an expert in your own body and how to, you know, if, if I'm looking to maintain, it's, I know what to do. If I want to change something, then I know I need to get a little bit more dialed in. But that's what led me to the interest in nutrition as a field. Nice. So you started hearing about this whole con the all these concepts about reverse dieting even before you became a dietitian, sounds mm -hmm. like right. So so this is obviously something that kind of started at the you know, kind of like the end of high school. And and was this like the reasoning, like or like the like again, like you like you said, this is what you kind of like developed and evolved into like, hey, I can actually study this as a career and I want to help people do this. Is that kind of what sparked their interest, your own experience? So I actually went into college, not as a, as a nutrition major. I went into college as a media culture communications major. So wow. I thought I wanted to work in journalism. I, I had this dream of working for Vogue. That was just in my head. And I went into college in 2008. It was, you know, the financial crisis. Magazines were folding right and left. Every, all of the biggest magazines were just shutting down. So it was this time where this glamorous lifestyle that I, you know, I went to NYU and I was like going to be the next Anna Wintour and I love writing, but I started interning at different magazines and I'm like, this is not what I want for my life at all. This is soul, soul sucking yeah. and not rewarding in any way and vapid and I just hated it. So I wound up interning for a website called Skinny in the City. It was, at, it was a dietitian who has a private practice in New York. It was sort of like her lifestyle vertical. So yeah. I had no idea. I don't think I even really thought of nutrition as a career at the time until I went there and I was writing for her website. And she's like, you know, I have this private practice thing going on. It's, you love nutrition and you love all of this stuff. Why don't you check out what I'm doing? So it was through that that I realized, oh, I can make this a career and I could also write and I could do the other things that I like as a dietitian. Nice. So, and the rest yeah. is history. Now here you exactly. are. Exactly. That's awesome. Well, that's, that's always kind of like cool to, to kind of hear people's backgrounds. I actually mm -hmm. like, um, like mine was more like I wanted to be a doctor that started like kind of like I was about to start med school and then I didn't really get into med school and I realized that, you know, doctors are not the only people that can help others as far as health. So it's really always cool to, to kind of at least as people like listen to people's perspectives and how they became a dietitian because usually it comes either from a passion or to, to help others or to help themselves. And I think it's pretty cool to, uh, to kind of heal people's stories. So that's pretty awesome. And now I want to go back into some one of, the, one of the things that you said, because I've had the pleasure to interview and you know her, Claire Tuning, which, you know, she's a huge advocate and intuitive eating. And I'm, I like to consider myself as a neutral dietitian. And even though I do practice like, you know, macro-based coaching, just like you do as well, um, I always kind of like say there, there, there's room for other kinds of methods. And, and I think like as dietitians, we cannot kind of stand and criticize one, one thing or the other. I do agree though, that I feel like some people have certain personalities that they they're data driven and I'm that way. Like I want to know numbers. I want to know this kinds of things. Now the question for you to kind of start this conversation behind macro coaching is how do you define the limitation between obsession and like and having balance? Like, you know, because like I know you track macros and sometimes you are more um strict than other times. So how did you kind of like not only to yourself but to your clients how did you establish that boundary or that limitation from obsession to just flexibility? 
That's really important. What With my clients, one question that I ask, and it was the same question I had to ask myself. If I put a, a slice of pizza in front of you and you were hungry and you love pizza, what would you feel? Would you be scared to eat it? Actually scared to eat it. What is this going to do to my body? I can't have this. This is going to ruin my diet. Because if, it, if you can't have something and just enjoy it and move on, that's a sign that something is getting a little bit too obsessive to me. So um, that feeling that, first of all, understanding that if you have a slice of pizza, it's not the end of the world. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to lose weight or see results or feel good in your body. So let's back up and look at, you know, the difference between weight loss and maintenance and refeeds and all these things, because there are a lot of different types of days that you can have and still get to your goal. Um, but also when I see people being so rigid where if they didn't hit their protein exactly that day, they're like, this was a waste. But the body doesn't work like that. So I think for me, what, when I was able to see that I didn't have every day, every day wasn't a perfect day, but I was still seeing the results I wanted. I, I was able to relax more about it. So you kind of have to learn by doing so I yeah. do have my clients say, you know, take a day off of tracking and see how you do. Could you take a day off and still see the results that you want? Um, so I think those things are helpful during yeah. the weight loss process. Yeah, I do agree because I feel like a lot of times, like I just literally had a check in with one of my clients. She's going to a wedding this weekend and she's freaking out because this is the first time she was, since we started working together that she's not going to have control because she doesn't travel often and she usually is home all the time and, and she controls most of the stuff that she eats. Um, with the exception of the occasional eating out type of thing. But, you know, this is an entire weekend and she is freaking out. And I feel like a lot of times with certain methods in certain ways, like people can become obsessive about it because they feel like they lose control when they, uh, when they essentially not have like the, the awareness of like, you know, something that is put in front of them. And a lot of times it's like overthinking the process because, you know, one of the things, I don't know how it's happened to you with your clients, but I feel like a lot of times, like I get most of my, like what I tell all of my clients is like I said, I want to make sure that you achieve the best results by eating the most amount of food, you know? And, yep. and that's kind of like the, the bigger thing because it, it, there's no point of you achieving goals by starving yourself and sacrificing your health. So I said, listen, like you're going to go into this wedding weekend and you're now eating like twice what you were eating before. Do you really think that this Saturday you know, eatery, unless you have like absolutely complete loss of control, which I'm sure you won't, do you think it's going to affect that? So when we kind of like look at it from that perspective, I think it makes a big difference. Does that kind of mm -hmm. happen to you and some of the clients as well? I always say the same thing that our goal is to keep the calories as high as possible while still having you see results. Um, because it's one thing to eat nothing and lose weight. You will do that, but there's nowhere to cut from. And for these situations, they become very difficult to handle. So I, I kind of explain it as I call it, it's a maintenance day. Even yeah. if you go 500 calories over what you normally do, so it's one day you maintain. You're yeah. not going backwards. What are some of the things that you kind of encounter the most with clients? When I was having a conversation recently with somebody that you know goals versus expectations, and and I think this is a really interesting conversation because I feel like us dietitians we do have to do a lot of like you know therapy in some way, shape, or form. Um, so. How do you define when, when you're working with clients and, and working with people, you know, like when somebody has a goal and is unrealistic and, and for example, somebody has, well, I expect to, because I feel like in, in, in this kind of programs that we do, like they kind of have this idea that, okay, if I put, if I apply this amount of pressure or this apply this amount of effort, I should expect this level of results. And when they don't come to that level of, of you know, how fast they're, they're, they're expecting it kind of things, they get very disappointed. So how do you have these conversations with clients to basically get them to understand, hey, listen, like this is, this is a, this is like kind of like a marathon that we're running here. It's very hard. <laughs> that is, that is very hard. And the scale fluctuations, that's a whole other story. Um, I think one thing is I like to put it in perspective of other diets that they've been on and maybe they've lost weight more quickly. Like they've been on diets where they've lost weight really, really quickly, but they can't sustain it. 
So we want you to be able to do this for 12 months until you finally get to that goal that you've always thought about and never have actually gotten there because you quit too soon. So I, I think it's not, that's not always enough though. They still, it's like, well, I'm putting in all this work and I want to see results faster. So you're not starving yourself. You're going out to eat. You're able to eat carbohydrates because most people that come to me are so fearful of them and haven't ever been on a diet where they can eat carbs and lose weight. Mm -hmm. And your mood is good. You have the energy. What's all that worth for the slow, the scale moving a little bit more slowly. And then I'm like, yeah, okay, that's true. Um, And then I think the other thing that really is helpful is looking at patterns So where people will get stuck at a certain weight for a little while and get really frustrated when that happens month after month and they see that it eventually drops, if they stay consistent, then it makes it easier. So it's always kind of harder in the beginning to manage those expectations when they've been doing it and they're like, okay, I look back, I've lost 10 pounds in three months. That's not so bad. If I, if I wait another three months and lose another 10 pounds, I would be, that'd be great. Yeah, I feel like people are so fixated on the week to week changes that mm-hmm. they 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 tend to not look at like the I call it like the ten thousand feet view, which is like okay, look at what you've achieved in the past. Like you know, okay, now it's been three months, it's been six months. You know, see what I was saying? Like you know, look at like when you look back and understand exactly like the changes that you made. And I think that's like the bigger, uh, kind of like the bigger goal and, and the bigger takeaway for a lot of these clients. Um, now, I wanted to, I was like thinking about this because I, I, I think not many people talk about this often, which is like the main reasons why I feel, like I feel like a lot of people reach plateaus. And I wanted to get your input and see how many we can come up with as far as, you know, like, like top reasons why you may not be seeing changes or results specifically or possibly if you have been tracking macros because I get all I, I get some clients sometimes or people that come to me and says like I'm nailing my macros and I'm not seeing anything happen so that's one side and also people that just don't follow that but then they eat super healthy and they super clean and yet they don't see anything happen so We'll take turns and we'll see kind of like what we can come up with. I was just thinking we can kind of wing it in here. Mm-hmm. So let's just kind of talk about some reasons why you feel that some people may be either hitting a plateau or not, they're not seeing the results that they're expecting. And you can go from like the, the simplest thing to like the more intricate, complicated aspect in here. Okay. So I was thinking a lot about this because it does happen. You get those people and they're like doing everything perfectly. Yeah. And you don't even know. I'm like, I don't even know what to tell you to change because I can't see anything. So those, those situations are, are really tricky. Sometimes it comes down to patience. Sometimes it comes down to a little bit of like a reverse dieting, mm-hmm. um, slowly adding the calories back. Maybe their body's holding onto water. Maybe they're stressed and all those things. And you add the calories back and the weight comes down a little bit. So I've seen that, but I think what's very common with my population who is women who have been on a lot of diets and have like actually more of a screwed up relationship with food by the time they get to me is they're doing really well five days a week or they're under eating five days a week and they're completely losing it on the other days where they're just binging or they're not tracking at all and they're just going completely nuts. So I see that a lot. Okay. And that's why I do talk to people about keeping the calories as high as possible because you're better able to actually, the deficit might be smaller, but you're better able to sustain it without binging, which happens when you do get very low. Okay. That's a good one. Now, mm -hmm. do you get a lot of people that sometimes you feel, this is something I like to always ask dietitians. Like, do you feel like people sometimes don't give you the whole story here uh, Mm -hmm. when it comes down to some of this stuff? Like they'll, I'm doing everything that you told me. Um, yet like they don't really talk about the weekend or they don't talk about this kind of stuff. You know, is that something that you see often people not really like this? We we call this concepts when we were in school, like Mm underreporting. Um, you know, is that something that you kind of encountered? Typically? Yes. 
I think so. Whether it's intentional or not intentional, one example of not intentional is when they're eating out and they're locking their food, but they're not accounting for oil or stuff like that. Like, I, I got broccoli and salmon, but it was sauteed broccoli and the salmon was crusted with pistachios and they're, they're not understanding how much that can really add. I think that olive oil is one of the biggest reasons why people <laughs> underestimate. So yeah. that's, that's one in there. Um, people don't realize that olive oil is so caloric because we think of it as such a healthy food and mm -hmm. it is healthy, but it's also highly caloric. Okay. Um, that's a good one. Yes. So I also think sometimes there is a little bit of embarrassment or they think like they're going to be in trouble or they're, or I'm going to think something badly of them. One of those things is alcohol mm -hmm. where I think that maybe they're telling me they they're drinking. They don't tell me how much, or they don't tell me what's going on with the food when they're drinking or they might not even remember. Yeah. So I see that, especially with my younger population, like college age. Mm hmm. That they just don't like they because you teach you teach your clients how they can still balance alcohol into their their, their mm -hmm. equation, but a lot of times it's just not balanced or or sometimes the excess or the the too much aspect of it, and then the combination with alcohol with like you know actually food and alcohol and 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 how that kind of fits into the equation, right? Yep. Okay, so that's a big one. So alcohol seems to be another one. Mm -hmm. Um, what about? Whenever I think another big one that I think it's another reason why a lot of people plateau is not changing things too much. So essentially it's say, um, and I want to ask your, your thoughts on like reverse dieting so you can kind of define it for people listening in. I've talked about it in the past, but a lot of times, like I like to get different the people's different perspective on this. Um, but do you feel that sometimes like people plateau because there's not a lot of variation on, and this could be people that maybe you haven't worked with and they, they've tracked macros in the past, mm -hmm. but then they feel like, they're just not moving and they're just, oh, I'm, I'm doing the same macros and I'm doing the same thing that I thought I was supposed to be doing. And I'm still in a deficit. You know, is that another reason you would consider to be another, um, I guess like, you know, option why people may not be kind of like seeing the scale move or, or something happen. Yeah. So I think that's, it's tricky because we have information about how the body works and how weight loss should work and on paper. And then we have, practical application and theoretically there's if they're still in a calorie deficit they should still be losing weight but sometimes they they're not um and changing something winds up getting things moving again you'll often hear like you have to change something up to break the plateau but there's really no scientific explanation for why that would work sometimes what happens is they change maybe they change something up and their adherence gets better or mentally just whatever it is Or maybe they, yeah. maybe just by the time they changed it, they broke, they put it in enough consistent days that it just, it would have moved anyway if they didn't change anything. Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I definitely think that yeah. with, for some people with insulin resistance, yeah. Changing up the carbs absolutely can be a big factor. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's like for, for us dietitians, it's really frustrating to try to figure out why because a lot of times it's like okay this person and the thing with like online coaching i think it's just like we don't really get to see and even in person i remember when i practice in person like you can't really look at people's like with like a magnifier glass and what they do every single day we would love to have the i mean i would love to be able to kind of spend an entire day with one of my clients looking at it through the window and really mm -hmm. see what's going on because i feel like it's gonna give me like a bigger perspective but Because I feel like it's a combination of either embarrassment. For some reason, people think of us as like the food police. Like, you know, I'm going to get in trouble if I do this. And people come to me and they're like, you're going to be so mad at me. I was like, why am I going to be so mad at you? <laughs> like, what's, I'm not going to yell at you because of this. I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. But then I'm not going to be mad at you for whatever. You should be mad at yourself if you feel like you kind of fell out of the, you know, kind of fell off of, or, or you just feel like, you know, you're not being as consistent as just wouldn't want to. So I think a lot of times that like, people have that dismissed conception of what one what we do and what what they're doing to be able to accomplish or seeing the results that they're really wanting to see so i think it's Absolutely. a key thing for that 
Now you mentioned the concept that you talked about a couple times in the past of reverse dieting. Um, like I said, I've mentioned it in the past, but I wanted to get your input on this. Can you briefly kind of define where reverse dieting is and what is, cause I feel like a lot of people that have listened to this in the past, they have the wrong idea that this reverse dieting is a process. Like, okay, I'm going to increase my calories for like a couple of weeks and then I'm going to bring things down. They don't really understand the time that this takes. And I see a lot of people that are super impatient, but before we get into that, why don't we define it and tell me a little bit more your perspective on what that is, and how do you implement it? Yeah, so I would say it's a strategic increase in calories to achieve a specific result. So the times when I, when I would use it is if a client comes to me or if they're a current client and their calories are already very low, but they're not seeing the results that they want or that we think that they should be seeing at that that amount. Because at that point, the only option is really, if you're not losing weight at 1200 calories, then we need to go to 1100 or 1000 or 900. And when does it stop? So I really, if a client comes to me eating that little, I'm not going to tell them to eat 900 calories. I'm just, like, I'm not the dietitian for them. They, you know, so what I do there is start increasing slowly. So what people I think confuse about reverse dieting is they're like, Oh wait, I eating more calories and I lost weight. I just, I was in starvation mode. No, something else may have been going on. You weren't in starvation mode, but when you add calories, you can still be in a caloric deficit, even, even at 1500 calories. Um, yeah. so, you know, but going from a thousand calories to 1500 calories overnight is going to come with scale the scale going up, whether or not you gain fat or not, that mentally is very difficult to handle. So doing it very slowly and incorporating it slowly is why, you know, it can take months to do the right way. Like you said, it just, it's not two weeks of eating a little bit more and then you're fixed. So, yeah. so not, so during the weight loss process, that might be why you use it. And then really after, as you're, as they're getting close to their goal, I start having them add very slowly. Um, while, because I know they'll still lose, but they're tar- starting to inch towards closer and closer towards maintenance yes. so that they understand how to maintain the weight that they lost rather than, okay, you hit your goal. I'll see you. Bye. Yeah. I think that makes a big difference now. I wanted to ask you because I feel like a lot of times like this also, it's really cool. Like it looks good on paper as far as like, you know, the, the, the science behind it. Now, what happens or did you encounter a lot of clients is sometimes like, yeah, that's ex- essentially what needs to happen, but they never tracked macronutrients before they have no clue. And then like, they're not even hitting the macro, like the macro targets, you know, the way that they're supposed to, they just, they're trying to play Tetris with my fitness pal. So how did you go about clients that are just, they're very new in this whole process, but you know that they're way under eating, like they're just because they're afraid of food and, and things of that sort. How do we, how do you approach those kind of situations? So uh, especially with that, if they have no, they've never tracked really anything before, I, I just start with calories. Like I want to even have them look at macronutrients until they have a better understanding of calories. And then each, not even week, but once they understand the calories, then we work on the protein and let fat and carbs kind of fall where they may. Mm-hmm. And then we start looking at each of those separately. Um, but in the beginning, if see, even though they're under eating, sometimes they don't realize that that's a problem that they need to fix. So yeah. they just want, they want, they come to you wanting to lose weight. You see what they're currently eating and you're like, no, 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 you have to be eating a lot more. Um, so you tell them to increase and they're like, and now my weight, but I'm maintaining. Yes, but you're eating so much more than you were when you were maintaining when you came to me. So it's, I think, it's reframing expectations a little too. Yeah. Um, and understanding that, listen, you came to me because you weren't losing weight and you were eating very little. So now you're not losing weight, but you're eating a ton more. Yeah. 
It's just trying to, it's just like you're saying, like reframing things because, and you had to repeat that so many different, so many times. And then you had to, okay, remember we talked about this last week, <laughs> you're staying at the same level and we increase like your calories by, you know, it's been like, you know, you started at X and then you're eating like three times more or two mm -hmm. times more than you were eating when you kind of started and look at your weight and then that kind of process. Now, how do you, or like, what's like the time? And I know this is obviously a very individual question. But, you know, and I guess like in a range, um, what is like some sort of time frames that you kind of create for people depending on what they start as far as like, hey, listen, we're going to do this for X amount of weeks or X amount of months before we bring you down or before we decide, you know, what your threshold is. And how do you define those things uh, when you're working with clients and you're trying to get them through this process of, you know, reversing and, and, and get them to eat as many calories as they can uh, to kind of like in some ways to perform, I guess we can call it reset everything in some way. Um, so what's that time frame look like in, in most of your clients? It's months. It's not weeks. It's not one month. That's for sure. To do it, to really, really do it the right way. I would say you need at least six, six plus months mm -hmm. yeah. to really get a good handle on it. But what as I explained is this is the last time you're going to need to do this. You don't ever need another coach unless you want one. If you want someone to hold you accountable, fine. But you should get everything that you haven't gotten from any other diet that you've been on from working with someone, a professional one on one who really cares about you. Because if I didn't care about you, I would tell you just to keep cutting your calories and not to eat bread and not to eat any of those things. But I won't let you lose weight that way. If you ever plan to eat bread again, you have to learn how to do it while you're losing weight. So I think understanding that it is going to take time. Yeah, it's it really is. It's a tough conversation to have with people. So it is um, a tough conversation. Yeah, and I think that's it. And I think like for 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 many, and I know you work a lot with with women. It's it's their background and where they're coming from. Um, and one of the things that we we talked about earlier, and I think we had this conversation when we did our nutrition roundtable, is is the background in which people have been brought up in. Um, and, and I feel like it, it kind of changes their perspective of dieting and nutrition. And the reason why I bring this up is because, you know, I think like if you've seen the news and I know you, you, you talked about this recently, um, like switching kind of like this conversation to talk about kids. And, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I see so many clients of mine that I know for a fact were brought up in a home where dieting was something I was imposed in them. They, they, the, the conversations about weight, the conversations about the next diet, the next fad with mom or dad or whatever may be the case that kind of instill some sort of, um, like drive for people to try to, to try to, tr right, to, to do the next big thing or like the next fad or whatever may be the case. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because, um, Weight Watchers, which by people listening in Weight Watchers is a company that's been around for ages, for decades. And it's essentially a point system. Some people compare it to macro tracking. It's just a lot different. Um, and essentially people were counting points. And I think for example, like certain amounts of like certain portions of cards represent certain points and protein and fats and stuff, stuff like this. But then there's a new app that came out that is called, I think it's like Kerbo Health or something like this, which is essentially an app for kids that it was developed by Weight Watchers. So first of all, I haven't looked at it and I know that you have, I believe. Mm -hmm. So can you tell, talk a little bit more? And I know this is like a big switch of conversation, but I really feel like this is important to talk about because I feel like, like I said, a lot of people come to us with that baggage and it's so hard to undo in like three months, four months, because it's a lifetime of, of like psychological, I'm not going to call it, I'm not going to call it damage, but in some way, shape or form, it could be some sort of, uh, um, kind of issue that kind of got them to that point. So, um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So as you said, so many of my clients, probably all of them have had, have their first diet was when they were very, very young. Many of them even, re even report going to Weight Watchers meeting with their moms. And that was like, that was their first diet. So many people have been on Weight Watchers at some point. And what I think, not just Weight Watchers, many diets, Atkins, especially black and white 
feelings about food. This food is bad and this food is good. And it, a lot of times it's carbs are bad, vegetables are good. And no understanding of really, this is what makes up this food. This is how you include it in, the, in, in your diet in a way that will allow you to reach your goals. Just if I eat this food, I'm bad. Then they spiral into like, okay, let me just ruin the whole day. So that black and white thinking starts early, but labeling food as good or bad or allowed or not allowed. And this, so the, the Curbo app is based on a red light, green light, yellow light system. So the red light foods are the ones that you should really not have. Those are the bad foods. The green light foods, those are the foods you can eat a lot of. Those are the good foods. And then the yellow light foods are somewhere in the middle. You have to be more cautious with them. Okay. The, I, I don't like the idea of red light already because there's no food that's inherently bad or good. It's just more nutrient dense, less nutrient dense. They serve different purposes. Um, what I really don't like about the app is that the coaches have no credentials at all. Really? I don't think they're even health coaches or anything. They're, so wait, there, there's coaches in the app? Like the, there's people that in there that you can contact to kind of teach you certain things about nutrition? So, yeah. So you could use the app for free and you can enter your food. And if you enter a day, it, it gives you how many red, greens, or yellows you've had. And you have a certain amount that you're allotted for the week. You could pay, I think it's $69 a month for a coach that you, you FaceTime with once a week for 15 minutes. And either the kid or the parent could be the one getting the coach, really? receiving the coaching. So the coaches that are on their website have no nutrition background at all. And especially at that age when kids are so vulnerable and they're still growing and there there's social pressures, there's pressure at home. It's a really tricky time. And it's not to say that kids that losing weight as a kid can never be okay or can never be healthy, but it's something that's so tricky. I would say like you need to be working with the therapist and a registered dietitian and a physician. Really, like you should yeah. really be under care of professionals. So yeah, that was the first thing that got me riled up because I know I started dieting early and that changed me. That, that had a big effect on my relationship with food as an adult. I, the biggest factor in me repairing that was the education that I received and to start learning about food just for, for what it is. But I could see how that could really spiral. So, yeah. And I think, cause I, cause I look at, um, I always think about myself and my, and my background and, and this is my mom never ever mentioned the word diet around our house. Like sometimes like he would tell my dad, like, Hey, like, you know, he need to, you know, cut a little bit of, you know, weight or something, but I don't ever remember. I was just thinking of having this conversation in my home. We never talked about it. We were never, we were not a family that had any kind of weight issues or problems. Like, you know, like granted that, but then still, and, and we live today and, and I have never, yes, there, we, I understand now because of my background in nutrition that I know there are foods that we need to eat in moderation and everything, but I don't have that kind of like stigma that I see so many people have. And I feel it's a lot of times rooted in the narrative that was part of your household, either that, or in other cases, it was just a lack of education that was not present, whether it was because you were in a low income family that, you know, you didn't really have food, you know, security or food availability or like the best like food choices or simply the fact that, you know, like you had the chance, but then they never taught you because they never knew. Like, you know, it's mm -hmm. like parents that didn't really have enough education as far as this to be able to kind of make um, good decisions around your food. Yeah. Or I think for many people, if mom was always on a different diet, she didn't even, they don't even know what they're doing. And it's not that they didn't have access to the education because they were paid, they're paying for diets and they're paying for nutritionists, but every month there's a different set of rules. And when you put those rules together, they don't make any sense. And now you're just fearful of everything pretty much. Yeah. Um, and you have no idea what you need to be doing. 
So I, and many of my clients now, when they, when we talk about their relationship with their mom around food, they're scared to tell them how they're doing it now. If they pick up a piece of bread, their mom will say, you're eating bread. You're trying to lose weight. They don't really understand it. So I do. I I think the way that you grow up is such a big factor. Yeah. Insanely important. And I think a lot of like, I honestly feel like that's like a root of a lot of the problems that we have today around dieting and, and people's perspectives on on nutrition and also the expectations that they have when they start a program with you, with me, because they're there. It's, it's, it's what they led to believe. Like I'm going to start a diet begins and ends and I mm-hmm. should expect X, Y, or C. So it's it's obviously that kind of narrative that makes a big difference. Now, a, a big question for you, because I've had this being, uh, somebody's asked me this, and then I work as a macro-based coach, just like you do. Do you ever get moms or parents ask you, can you do macros for my kid? Can you do macros for my my son? my uh, Or if, whether it's an athlete or a girl or whatever may be the case, what is your typical answer for that? And how do you approach those kind of situations? Do you think there's room for macro-based coaching in, in kids or teens? Um, or do you think there's a different approach that we need to have when it comes down to this? So I very seldom, seldomly work with kids. Um, really, I'll, I'll work with teenagers once in a while. But what's so difficult about working with kids is that you're really working with the parent. Yeah. and and two with Weight Watcher with this Weight Watchers app is are we is an eight year old kid really making all of the food decisions in the house? Yeah, not really. Um, so I think there's room. F- I think there's a lot of room and a need for macronutrient education if for everyone. I, I think that's uh, to me that's one of the biggest problems with diet culture is that no one actually really knows what food is and what it's made out of people, people say to me, I don't even know what a macro, I don't know what macronutrients are. So to me, that's a big problem. So I don't think it's not always about counting or obsessing. It's about being aware of them and how they work together and how once you understand them, you can eat all different kinds of foods, protein, fat, and carbs and know how to balance them. So I think there's a little bit of room for that. Um, I think having some like a kid strictly like put their food in an app and have these set limitations is probably not yeah. the best way to go about it. But I do like to give goals of what meals should look like. And um, I know some, some RDs will use like an exchange system, Yeah, you know, get this many servings of protein, this many servings of fat, this many servings of carbs. And it kind of at the end of the day works out to be, Obviously, we're controlling calories, um, yeah. but having them like start putting things in an app is if that said, there are people like me. I found the, I found my fitness pal myself. This, this was like <laughs> 2005. I can when only imagine. Out, yeah. yeah, I can only imagine now if you go on the Internet, you stumble, you start doing these things without anyone telling you to do them. So at that point, I wish I would have had someone like me who would have said, instead of this dietitian who said, eat 3000 calories, like let's get you to a place where you understand food a little bit better. There's no reason you should be restricting these different things. Um, so it is a fine line, but I think kids shouldn't be counting. Yeah, I do agree 100% with every single thing you said, because I've, I've had that happen to me and I go, Oh, can you please calculate the macros for my kid? And I'm like, what's the goal that you're trying to achieve by doing this? Like, well, I just want to make sure I'm feeding them right. Well, you need to teach him or her how to do this properly, not necessarily telling them you need to stick to specific foods and stuff. And that kind of started changing the narrative though, because like the whole, I like the whole concept of flexibility. I like the concept of being able to have, you know, to teach your kids that they can have anything they want, but then, you know, what are like the foods that are going to support their goals or the, the stuff that is going to support whatever, you know, having energy and being able to play and being able to do these different things. And I feel like when they change that narrative and you go from, instead of having a conversation about weight, it's more a conversation about how this is going to make you feel and all the different things about energy and hunger and stuff. I feel like it changes everything because they can start to make decisions on their own. And honestly, like this even applies to adults. Like, you know, we're a lot of 
times, like, you know, I, I said, like, you know, I said this about myself too. Sometimes adults are kids and in some way, shape or form, we can teach them the same way and, and this stuff applies to them. And I feel like it makes a bigger impact in okay. their overall pursuit of their goals. So I think that's a, that's a pretty impactful thing. So, um, cool. Well, like, uh, we're, I want to be respectful of your time, Alex. So I wanted to, um, first, before we wrap it up, I do have some, what I like to call rapid fire questions. Uh, so hopefully you're ready for this. The only thing you need to do and the only rules is that you need to answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. <laughs> you ready to go? Yep. Awesome. All right. So first question would be favorite exercise. Go. Deadlifts. Ooh, uh, that's nice. I like that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's my favorite one too. I just did like a million of them. I had a cross. So effective. <laughs> yeah. It's a full compound movement. So I love that. Exactly. Those. Do you have an exercise background by the way or no? Yeah, I do. I'm also, a, I'm a personal trainer and I oh. taught spin while I was oh, in grad school. I think you, I heard about, I think you mentioned it was a soul cycle, right? So I taught at Equinox, an Equinox. But I, and then I worked at the front desk at Soul Cycle. Oh, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's cool. I think I saw something about that. All right. Yeah. Cool. Second question would be um, a book that you would give somebody that they should have in their shelves of their home. So I, I was going to, uh, immediately going to say Daily Stoic because that was, but I gave that one on the last, um, the last podcast. So mm -hmm. we're right now I'm reading Howard Stern's book. Okay. It's actually cool because it's What's a bunch it of interviews. I don't even know what it's called. How Howard, it's, his, it's his newest book that he came out with. And it's just yeah. a compilation of some of his best interviews. He has, I mean, he has everyone from Anderson Cooper to Donald Trump to Harvey Weinstein. Nice. So it's interesting. It's um, in their minds and stuff. It's kind of like the book by Tim Ferriss. I think I have it yep. called Tools of Titans or something. And uh, Tribe of Mentors. <laughs> oh, they have yeah, right here. Another Tim Ferriss. Yeah, That's but you good. can kind of turn to a page and and just read it, read the chapter, and it, it stands alone. So I like that. Okay, awesome. Yeah, and I remember I was talking about the Daily Stoic because we, we both read it. I, I've been reading mm -hmm. that book for three years in a row. Like I still, it's like the, the it's a daily reader for me and I repeat <laughs> it and repeat it and repeat it because I feel like- It means something you know, new based on where something. you are in your life. Yep, and I think that's powerful. Um, third question, I think you may remember it, uh, podcast or, by the way, like, well, first of all, a podcast you would recommend people listening to um, that you are a fan of or that you've heard that you know, provides really cool value as far as nutrition. As far as nutrition goes, um, I like the Mind Pump podcast. Okay, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard of it. Um, by the way, because I wanted to mm -hmm. ask you, are you starting a podcast pretty soon or no? Is I'm going a, to. Is that a it's, secret? It's like on a the list. No, <laughs> no, maybe if I put it out there, it'll actually get done. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we're actually going to hold you accountable. Now you're exactly. actually going to do this podcast and then we're going to expect, you know, the Alex tour of podcast show exactly. um, anytime soon. So that's, that's exciting. Yeah, I wanted yeah. to ask you about that. Um, all right, cool. The last one would be, I'm not sure what you mentioned last year, last time on this question would be if you were stranded on a desertic island and you would choose one food to have for the rest of your life what would that be pizza <laughs> good that's the second person today that had pizza really so that's a good one yes um i had a, i had a really cool interview with a dietitian who she's a beef advocate and she actually goes around you know teaching you know the the pe what people don't know about beef and i was expecting her to talk about you know like let's say like oh i want to have like a sirloin for like you know for that and she said pizza i was like i was not expecting that but that's <laughs> So that's, that's funny. That's awesome. Now I know that you just launched a pretty cool signature program. So why don't you tell people listening in, how can people find you and then tell us about the signature program that you have so people can go and find it. And cause I know it's pretty awesome. Thanks. So you can find me on Instagram. I'm over there ranting about fad diets. A lot of the time at Alex Turoff underscore RD. And from there you can find my website and my signature program is called the real method. And basically it is a nutrition 101. So I, it's, it's a course and you work yourself through it, starting from how to calculate your own calories and macronutrients, what a calorie is, what protein, fat, and carbs are, what fiber is. Um, it comes with meal plans and recipes and tips and tricks and all kinds of different guides and videos. So it's sort of like a crash course to macros. Okay. That's cool. And they can find it on your website. Mm -hmm. 
That's awesome. Yeah. And we're yeah. going to go ahead and link uh, all this stuff up on the show notes so people can go and um, click on it and go check it out. And if you, like I said, if you have any questions to Alex, make sure you go and find her on Instagram. I think that's the fastest way to get a hold of you. Correct? Yep. That is awesome. Well, Alex, it's been a pleasure to have you here on today's uh, episode of Vivid Nutrition Radio. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. You have been listening to Vivid Nutrition Radio. A couple of things before you take off. If you enjoyed this episode, please, I would love to get your feedback. So feel free to drop down a review and I will be forever grateful. Also, if you like this podcast, make sure you hit the subscribe button. We have it on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And lastly, if you would like to receive a freebie from me, make sure you sign up for our newsletter at www.vive-nutrition.com. See you guys in the next episode. Ciao, ciao.